Please take your Bible this morning, if you would, for our scripture reading to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, please, for our scripture reading. And uh, we will read verses 12 through 24. Mark 11 and verses 12 through 24. Read the verses responsibly, as we normally do, beginning together on verse 12, and I'll read 13. We'll alternate until we end together on verse 24. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. <clears throat> All of us standing pleased to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 12, Mark chapter 11. Ready? And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And they came to, excuse me, and they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple. <coughs> and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, it is, is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it, and saw it how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answering, saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, which he, then he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Thank you so much, Lord, for the Bible. We thank you, Lord, for your words that you have given to us. Thank you for the good service we've had so far this morning. Thank you for the good spirit that's here in this room. Father, I pray that you would help us now to begin to focus and keep our attention uh, upon you. I pray you'll bless the special, that uh, it will tune our hearts to you, Lord, and that we will look to our God this morning to meet our need. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. I don't know how God hangs the world on nothing or how he keeps the planets in each place. I cannot count the sands upon the seashore, nor can I count the stars that float in space. But God can do what seems impossible. God controls eternity. My mind can never comprehend it, but God in heaven cares for me. I don't know how the Lord can save a sinner and by his grace can cleanse and set him free. I can't explain the mystery of Calvary to think that Jesus died for even me. But God can do what seems impossible. 
God controls eternity. My mind can never comprehend it, but God in heaven cares for me. I don't know all the meaning of forever or just how long it's been since time began. I can't explain how Christ, who is eternal, could come to earth and die for sinful man. But God can do what seems impossible. God controls eternity. My mind can never comprehend it. But God in heaven cares for me. Yes, God can do what seems impossible. God controls eternity. My mind can never comprehend it. But God in heaven cares for me. Amen. Now, Father, we come to the preaching of your word, and I pray, Lord, for your help this morning as I desire to bring the truth here from Mark chapter 11. I pray, Lord, for each one as they listen this morning that your spirit would minister to their heart, that he would be our master teacher today. Lord, may your will be accomplished here in our midst here in the next few moments. Please guide us and lead us and open our understanding of your word this morning and of this truth, please. We need your help. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can check this, Dean. Doesn't sound right to me. Different ones use it and uh, make sure it's on loud enough for me this morning. Mark chapter 11, if your Bible's still open there, Jesus passes a fig tree. And he sees some leaves on it and he's hungry. And uh, so he approaches it hoping to find some fruit. And uh, there is no fruit on the tree. A fruit tree... The, the fig tree will uh, usually produce figs before it produces foliage. And uh, so when he saw the leaves, he just believed there ought to be some figs there too. And of course, when it wasn't there, the, the, the fig had produced no fruit. And, and it's interesting <clears throat> because Mark tells us in verse 13, the time of figs was not yet. And what it's referring to here is you, most of you know that when there's fruit trees or when there's crops that, that bear fruit, they have some uh, what they call first fruits that come out. It's not the main harvest. It's some fruit that comes out early. And uh, that's what was Jesus was expecting to find here, even though the main harvest of fruits was not yet uh, at, at hand. And so he's expecting to see some fruits there, but there was nothing there but leaves. In other words, the tree is not producing what it was planted there to do. And so Jesus does what any good, uh, I don't know what you call somebody who keeps an orchard, uh, an orchardist or something, whatever, uh, is that a word? Um, whatever that person would do, and that is you remove the tree. You know, he doesn't have to use an axe. He doesn't have to uh, use a saw. He just, by faith, said to the fig tree, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. Boom. Now, they go on into the city, and I don't know if disciples thought any more about it or not, because they go into the city. There's the issue of the temple where Jesus, you know, overthrows the tables and drives everybody out of the temple. Quite a, quite a scene in itself. And uh, preaches the message. Evening comes, and they're going back out of the city. Then morning comes, in verse 20, and they're passing by where they were the day before. And they see the fig tree. And it's dried up from the roots. And Peter notices it. And Peter is always one to speak about what he notices. And so he speaks. And he said, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. 
dried up from the roots. And Jesus answers Peter. And notice what he said. He said to Peter, Have faith in God. Have faith in God. I want us to focus on those words this morning. I want us to focus on the words Jesus gave to Peter. Have faith in God. Those four words. To you desiring to see your loved ones saved, have faith in God. To you who are desiring to see your marriage restored or get better, improve, have faith in God. To those who are desiring to see some obstacles removed out of their life, have faith in God. To those who are here this morning needing a miracle in your life, have faith in God. To those this morning who need to see a healing in their body, have faith in God. Those are here this morning who need their finances, you need some help financially, you need divine intervention, have faith in God. Those who maybe just want to get your life in order, have faith in God. I think we could take the time this morning and, and we could go to every seat in the room and every person here and you could share what you need from Jesus today. What you need from God today. But before we get to that, we find that Jesus tells us what He needs from us. What He needs from us. And what He needs from us is faith. Faith. Now, as, as we've been in the Reformers Unanimous program for five and a half years, we, we know that faith is a personal, their definition is a personal measurement of the level of confidence that I have in what Christ has done and will do in, through, and for me. Now, that's a long definition, okay? Let's, let's, look, at, let's look at what the Bible says faith is, okay? We're going to come back. Uh, to Mark 11, but I want you to look at Hebrews 11. Would you go to the book of Hebrews and look at chapter 11? Here's where the Bible gives a definition of faith. It is, by the way, I, it is a personal measure of the level of your confidence that you have in God, uh, in not only what He has done, but what He will do, and He does it in, through, and for us. That's the, that's the uh, definition we have learned in Reformers Unanimous. But look at what Hebrews 11.1 1 says. Now faith is the what, church? Substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance. Now look, not a substance, the substance. What's substance? You know what substance is? I'll define it for you. Substance is the essential part Substance is the main or material part. Substance is something real, not imaginary. Something solid, not empty. That's your dictionary definition of faith. And that's interesting, isn't it? So, faith is essential. Faith is real, not imaginary. Most people, when you think of faith, you think they're just kind of hoping for something. Wishing, that's faith. And, and that's, that's not, faith is substance. Faith is the integral part. It's the main part that makes up our Christian life. It's the substance by which we live as a Christian. Because we walk by faith, not by sight. So we have to have substance. It's a means of living. It's a way of living <clears throat> to receive the things hoped for, verse 1 says. It's the, the, the way of living that's the uh, a material substance, the material part. It's something real that, that we obtain things hoped for. In fact, then it says it's the evidence of things not seen. Evidence. That which enables the mind to see truth. Evidence. An instrument or writing which contains proof. Evidence, a witness, one who testifies to a fact. So our faith is what testifies to the fact. Our faith is what enables our mind to see the truth. 
You understand? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because without faith, you never see the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What do you need to be able to see that you need Jesus as your Savior? You need faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You have to have faith. When you read the Bible, to understand the truth, to grasp the truth, you, to be taught the truth, you have to have faith. You're in Hebrews 11. In uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Would you look there with me, please? Hebrews chapter 4. Notice verse 1. Hebrews 4, verse 1. Let us therefore fear lest the promise being made left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Now watch verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. All right, look at me. Two different groups of people both heard the word of God preached. One, it profited, it helped, it was a benefit, the other, it did not. They both heard the same message, same Bible, same truth. One, it helped. One, it profited. One, it didn't. Why? What's the rest of the verse say? Say, the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with what? Faith in them that heard it. What makes the difference when you come to church and you hear the message preached and one person says, man, that was good. Boy, that was a blessing. And someone else says, really? I didn't, I didn't get anything out of that. What's the difference? They both heard the same message. They both heard the same scriptures. They both heard the same truth. But one of them mixed it with faith. They, they, they said it enabled their mind to see the truth. You see, that's what faith does. So stepping out in faith enables us to be taught spiritual things. Have faith. Faith in God. That's why God will give us the faith we need. It's the instrument of truth, if you will. And so faith is what God expects from us. You know, without faith, there's no salvation. You don't get, you're, the only way you're saved is by faith. Taking God at His word. It's the gift of God. There's no victory. This is, whatsoever is born of God, 1 John 5, 4, overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our Faith. So without faith, you don't have salvation. Without faith, you don't have victory over the world. Without faith, you don't get the promises of God's Word. Hebrews 6 and verse 12, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. In fact, Paul goes on to say in Romans 14 and verse number 23, that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatever I'm doing that is not by faith in God is sin. That's a, that's a very narrow and straight road to walk. But that's what God expects of us. That is, that is faith is defined. And God defines it for us here in the Scripture. It's substance. It's real. It's not imaginary. It's solid. It's the main or material part of the believer. It's the evidence. It's that which enables us to see the truth. When you go to trial and you're trying to figure out what actually happened and whether someone's good or innocent, you know what you need? You need evidence and something that will bring to light so you see the truth. That's what faith does for us with the things of God. It enables us to see the truth. That's what Jesus meant when he said, except you be born again, you'll not see the kingdom of God. You can't see it. You're blinded to it. What opens the eyes to the truth of God? Faith. Faith does. So that's faith defined. It's what God expects of us. And then I want you to notice faith is also detailed. Jesus, going back to Mark 11, when he taught Peter here about, and the disciples really, he said, have faith in God. Did you notice he didn't just say, have faith? Those, those last two, wor two words are pretty important. In God. <clears throat> you see, it's not faith in anything. 
It's certainly not faith in yourself. It's certainly not faith in the worldly system we live in. Our worldly method. It's not faith in our own merit. It's faith in God. The object of our faith is God Himself. That has to be the object of our faith. Those are critical words in God. See, faith always has to have an object. Nobody just has faith. Faith has to be in something. You have to have an object for your faith. Faith is no value by itself. And the object, listen, it's the object that we put value on. That's why we put our faith in it. We put our trust in it. We put our confidence in it. It's the object. And God is that object. The Bible never says have faith in your faith. It says have faith in God. Have faith in, in the Lord himself. Too often, too often we think when we get a problem or we face an obstacle in life and somebody encourages us to say, well, you've got to have faith, brother. Come on, you just have to have more faith. And we think if we just somehow can build up enough faith, we can do okay. But it's not, it's not, it's not the faith, it's the object of the faith. We have to get faith in God. Get our focus on God. Get our focus on the one who can do the impossible. The one who can do anything. The one who said, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything too hard for God? What's the answer? No. The, the answer isn't me and me mustering more faith. The answer is me placing the faith I have in God and not in myself. What are you going to do? I'm still trying to figure it out. Isn't that how we talk? Well, I haven't figured out what I'm going to do yet. Well, stop figuring and put your faith in God. Put your trust in the Lord. The, 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 our mind and our attention and our heart is not focused on faith. It's focused on God. Get to focus on the right thing. Focus on the solution. And the solution is not something, it's someone. It's God. We tell the, the, those who are in addiction that the, 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 the solution is not something, it's someone. It's Jesus Christ. And you have to get focused on the solution. Faith isn't going to remove the mountain. Faith in God removes the mountain. Listen, faith doesn't move the mountain. God moves the mountain. God takes care of that. I heard a, a, real life, a, a, a true story, and it was down in West Virginia where these, these, uh, they, they had, uh, dead, were getting ready, I think in two weeks, they said, to dedicate a church building, and, and uh, they came for the final inspection, and they added up the parking places, and they said, you don't have enough parking places for the occupancy of your building. said, you're going to have to, there was, it was set in right behind where the, where the choir would be was a, was a, a mound, a big mountain. And they said, you're going to have to dig out that mountain and put some parking in. Two weeks before they open. And they don't have any money. And pastor told that to the congregation on the Sunday. He said, two weeks from today, we're supposed to dedicate the new building. And he said, we've don't, we, we don't we got to get that mountain moved. So we're going to have a prayer meeting. And he called a prayer meeting. And they, they claimed the promise that if you have faith in God, God can move the mountain. They prayed for three hours. As a church, for God to move the mountain. And they did that on a Sunday, Xavier. And, and, and the pastor's at the church on Monday, and he said, and a knock came on his door and said, that, uh, they're from a construction company that's building a shopping center on the other side of town, and he said, we need dirt. <laughs> no, this is a true story. And he said, if you'll let us have that dirt behind your church, We'll put a parking lot in and pave it for you. That's a true story. And, and, and that's exactly what they happened. In two weeks, they moved into their church building. Now, what did that? Oh, their faith? No, no, no. God did that. God did that. See, when we say my faith did that, then the focus is still on me. No, no, no. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about God. And I'm on my faith and trust in God. You know, most everyone who came to Jesus had weak faith. 
It's not the matter. It's not a, in fact, when he said uh, that you could remove mountains, he said you just needed faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed. Nothing to do with the size of your faith. Everything to do with the size of your God. That's who it has to do with. Where do you place your faith? So faith is detailed and faith was defined. Let me show you where faith is demonstrated. And it's all through the scripture. We could be here for a long time looking at the different demonstrations. But let's look at one in Matthew chapter 15. Would you look there? Matthew chapter 15. Verse number 21, Matthew 15, verse 21. Boy, your pages are turning a long time. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. Okay, does that help you? I'm like that pastor. I love to hear the pages of the Bible rustle. I just don't like to hear them rustling so long. Then I wonder what's going on. All right, verse 21, Matthew 15, ready? Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I'm not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It's not me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Well, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat from the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Here's a woman who comes and, boy, talk about being discouraged. She's a it lets us know that she was a Syrophoenician woman. She wasn't a Jew. In other words, and that's why Jesus said, that's why Jesus didn't answer. He said, I've just come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She's a Gentile. And so, and that's, in, in the disciples, they were real compassionate, weren't they? Jesus, get rid of her. She's bothering us. Okay? And yet, that didn't, none of that stopped her. And by the way, not just her faith, but her faith in Jesus. She wasn't going to be denied. Why? Her daughter's dying. She wanted to, Jesus to heal her daughter. And even Jesus, when he finally spoke to her, wasn't real encouraging. He said, I, I'm not going to take bread and give it to the dogs. That's, that was the term the Jews called Gentiles. Not a not a real, in fact, even today, when you want to insult somebody, you call them a, a dog. You dirty dog. Hmm? Or she's ugly as a dog. Huh? I'll stop there. But <laughs> the, you get the idea. Discouraging. But she didn't let that discourage her. You know what she said? Yeah, but the dogs get the crumbs that fall off the table. I'm sure Jesus had to shake his head to say, wow. You know what she's saying? I, I don't need the whole loaf for my daughter to be healed. I just need a crumb. Just a crumb. And God rewarded her faith. That's a great demonstration of faith, of confidence in Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew chapter 8 with me, would you? Go back to your left a little bit in Matthew I'll try to keep you in the same book so you can get there quicker. <laughs> Matthew chapter 8, verse number 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority having soldiers unto me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, to another come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto him that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. 
And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west, shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast in outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so it be done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. Same thing. This man came and had a servant ill. And again, Jesus is willing to go to him. And he says, you don't have to go. I, I know the power of your word. I understand the power of a word. I understand authority. Because I have people under me, soldiers. I tell them to do something, I know they'll do it. I tell them to come and they come. I tell them to go, they go. You just tell this sickness what to do and it'll obey you. That's the, 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 the faith he had in the power of the word of Jesus. How much faith do you have in the power of the word? Hmm? Well, you need to read your own. I've been reading the Bible. That's how we treat it. No, no, no. You don't, you don't understand the power of the word. You're not understanding the power of the, the, that the word of God has. That's where your faith comes in. Faith in God. Faith is demonstrated. Remember, remember the four guys who had their paralyzed friend and they were trying to get him to Jesus? And the crowd was around the house and they, they said, man, we'll be here forever waiting in this line. So they went to the side of the house, up the steps, onto the roof, and began to tear the roof up. They got a hole big enough to let the fella down inside. And Jesus said, the Bible says he looked up and he saw their faith. If those guys believed in me enough, that they'd cut a hole in this guy's roof and let their friend down to me. He said, your sins are forgiven. Take up your bed and walk. He met him outside carrying his bed. Yeah. Another demonstration of, of faith. Woman gets her daughter healed. A centurion gets his servant healed. A, these four men get their friend healed. How about Peter. Remember, remember the deal where they're out on the water and the storm comes up and then uh, it's the middle of the night, like two in the morning or whatever it is, or three in the morning, third, fourth watch of the night. Jesus came walking on the water. Remember that story? And when they realized it was Jesus, what did Peter say? Yeah. Lord, let, let me come to you on the water. And the great thing is, Jesus said, Come. And I mean, he didn't have to wait. He didn't have to, con come on, Peter, you can do it. Come on, come on, come on. No, 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 just come. And I mean, Peter had one leg over. He was stepping out. And listen, it wasn't calm. It was still storming. The waves were still crashing. I mean, you talk about faith. That took some faith. Nobody else was volunteering to go with him. Nobody else was fighting Peter to get out of the boat. Peter was. There's only two people ever walked on water, Jesus and Peter. And he did walk on the water. Huh? See? Then he, he got distracted by the other things and he got his eyes off the object of his faith. And that's when he began to sink. Isn't that when we sink? When we get our eyes off the one whom we're supposed to have our faith in and we get to looking at other people, other circumstances, other things in our life, and we sink. How did he keep from sinking all the way under? He cried out to Jesus, didn't he? Lord, save me! And immediately Jesus reached out, picked him up, and he saved him. It's amazing. Great faith, really. I mean, he'd not practice, you don't practice walking on water. It's just something you believe, and you trust God for. We could go on. I could talk about ten lepers that were healed of leprosy or the woman who touched the hem of his garment who had wasted all her money on all the physicians and wasn't any better, only got worse. We could talk about Jairus' daughter. We could talk about blind Bartimaeus. But I, I got news for you. It isn't just in the pages of the Bible. We had an older lady, retired couple. You've heard me talk about Marvin Bostow. He was a retired preacher from South Dakota and was in our church when we pastored in Arizona. And his wife, Laureen Bostow, she played the piano for us. And she had fallen and cracked her hip. 
And they wanted to do surgery. She didn't want to have surgery. And she called the, the church and asked if we would anoint her with oil and pray. So some of the men of the church went to her home and we anointed her with oil and asked God to heal her hip so she wouldn't have to have surgery. And she was so excited when she called and said she went in the doctor and before they did surgery, she said, I just want you to do another x-ray. And they didn't want to. No, we've already x-rayed. No, she said, do another x-ray. I'm not going to let you operate. And they did another x-ray and they came back shaking their heads saying, you don't have any crack in your hip anymore. It's gone. And she knew it was gone. What happened? God, God took care of that. God healed her. I'm, I'm saying, have faith in God. Have faith in God. We've seen that happen in our church. Here's Brenda Parrish sits here this morning, six years plus, cancer free. No, no chemotherapy. No. She, she changed some of her diet. We ask God to heal her. We ask God to take care of her. And God in his mercy did so. Diane, five years, cancer free. But she also was anointed with oil and prayed for. God has healed her. I'm saying, have faith in God. Hey, these things aren't just in the Bible. Yeah, that's good for those people. That, that doesn't happen to people today. Oh, it happens to people today. It's happened to people in this room today. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. You've heard me tell the story of starting Reformers Unanimous and needing the $1,105 to start up cost. Get all the original, you know, get all the books and all the things you need to get started with and didn't have it. Just were praying about it and got the phone call from Mr. Williams next door here asking if like they did here, park these trailers in the back. Big project, they need more room for storage. And he said, how much would you charge me for six weeks to park some trailers back there? I said, man, I don't know what to charge you. I said, I have no idea what that would be. He said, Pastor, no amount you tell me would, would surprise me. And that's when the Lord brought that figure to my head, $1,105 to start Reformers Unanimous. I said, you know what? We're starting an addictions program on Friday night. It's $1,105 to start it. I'll rent that space to you for $1,105. And he said, you'll have a check this afternoon. And he sent the check over for $1,105, and we started Reformers Unanimous. See, that's God. That's God. Have faith in God. We, it was two years ago, preparing for our missions conference, we were behind in faith promise for that year and didn't have the money set aside for the conference, really didn't know... Uh, you have doubts whether maybe we, maybe we should even have a conference. I, you, have, you have missionaries in. You ask them to be with you for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you know, four, four days out of their week, and you want to give them a, a good offering. They live on that and whatever little support they have. And you just, you know, you have three or four families in. It, it, it costs some money to have a missions conference. And you feed them meals every day, and you take care of them. And uh, I, I didn't have that praying about what to do about that and, and just went ahead and planned it and scheduled it and just went forth by faith that God would take care of it. And uh, right after service, one Sunday morning, somebody, one of the members, walked up to me and put a check in my hand. They said, God had blessed us and we wanted to give this and opened that up and it was a check for $5,000. And we had a missions conference. You see? That's God. God, have faith in God. God. We went to the RU inside and started having the RU in the prison. And uh, God's doing great things with the RU inside. I, I think it'll be this May, four years that we've been in CRC. Four years? Yeah. At CRC. And um, I don't know how long we've been at London. Has it been two years yet? It's almost two. We didn't, you know, here again, none of the prisoners can buy any of the material. The Overcomer books, the Phase 1, Phase 2, Phase 3, Phase 4, Daily Journals, all that material is, we have to give it to them. So we got to buy it and just give it to them. Well, how are you going to do that? I don't know how I'm going to do that. What what I do? i got to have faith in God. And we talked about that here, and, and huh, there's somebody in our church wrote a check for $3,000. 
to get material for the RU inside. That carried us quite a long way. You know what that is? That's God. That's God. God. And, and by the way, it's exciting when you see God do that. It's also exciting when you're the one that God touches the heart to do something like that. While we get blessed by that, you know who's blessed this morning? The, the one who's blessed is the person who God touched the heart to give the money. They're blessed because, you know what, God used them. And God uses people. And God doesn't just use people of the Bible. God uses people like you and me. And he, He's not changed at all. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What I'm saying is, have faith in God. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what problem you're up against. I don't know what difficulty you're, 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 you're dealing with. But listen, have faith in God. God can do anything. As Bob saying this morning, God can do what seems impossible. He controls eternity. Wow. The negative talks, but faith will hear the Spirit of God. The need talks, but faith hears the words of the Savior. The naysayers talk, but faith heeds the promises of God. Faith in God will pick you up when you've been defeated. Faith in God will pick you up when you've been defeated in depression or darkness or disease or even the death of a loved one. The goal is for us to be Christ-like. The goal is for us to be like Jesus. And that means we have to go into the realm of impossibilities and make them possibilities. How do you do that? Have faith in God. I don't know what you're facing today, but I know this. You need to have faith in God. You have to have faith in God. It's a walk of faith, not by sight. You take your eyes off the visible, and faith allows you to see the invisible. And that's God. What do you need today? What are you looking for? at today in your life that seems like it's an impossibility. This seems like I'll just it'll never change, it'll never come about, I'll never conquer this, or I won't, this won't take place, or this won't happen, or they'll never change, or this will never get any better, or I don't see this ever happening. What is it that you're looking at? You're looking at the circumstance, you're looking at the situation instead of having faith in God. God can do the impossible. There's nothing too hard for Him. Don't live your life based on what you see here. Live your life based on what God shows you in here. Live your life based on what God shows you in here. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Have faith in God. Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you for everyone's attention today. Thank you, Lord, for the admonition. These four simple words that Jesus gave to his disciples. Have faith in God. Lord, I don't know what everyone's going through. But I know we all face situations that are like moving a mountain to us. Which just looks impossible. But may we not just say, I have to have faith. May we say, I have to have faith in God. You're our God. To whom can we go? You're the one who's almighty, and you're the one who can do anything. God, I pray you'd speak to hearts this morning. Those who are discouraged, those who are feeling defeated, those who are feeling depressed and pushed down by the circumstances and situations that they find themselves in, oh, may they take the encouragement this morning. Have faith in God. May they bow the knee this morning and put their faith in the God who can do the impossible in their life. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. 
I wonder how many folks this morning can say, Pastor, I know if I died today, I'd go to heaven. I'm, I know there's a time in my life when I put my faith in Christ as my Savior. And I know if I died this morning, I'd go to heaven because my faith is in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Here's my hand as a testimony. Will you slip it up that I may see it today? I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. I don't have the assurance in my heart that if I died, I would go to heaven. But, Pastor, I'd like to have that assurance. Would you let me pray for you? I'll not embarrass you or call you out, but I will pray for you. Would you slip your hand up and just say, Pastor, pray for me this morning? God bless you. Thank you. Appreciate that. I wonder how many believers here today would say, Pastor, God, God had that message for me this morning. I'm dealing with some things or, and I'm trying to face some things in my life and what I needed was the encouragement to have faith in God. God can do anything but fail. Trust Him. I wonder how many today would say, Pastor, I've got some things going on and I need to have faith in God. He spoke to my heart today. Pray for me this morning. Would you slip your hand up? Oh, that's good. Yes. Many people this morning. Praise the Lord. You may put them down. In a moment, I'm going to pray, and we'll have our invitation. If you're here today, God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning. Just come and bow the knee at the altar and respond to what God's told you to do. If you slipped your hand up and said, I don't know. If I died, I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to know. You come, too, while they're coming to pray. And we'll have someone take a Bible and show you how you can know you're on your way to heaven. If you're here today and you're saved and you've never been scripturally baptized, you say, I need to come and I need to be obedient in baptism. Maybe you're saved and you're baptized and you believe this is where you ought to belong, that God would have you serve at Bible Baptist Church. Then you come and say, Pastor, we're saved, we're baptized, and we believe this is where God would have us to belong and to serve. And we'd be glad to welcome you into the fellowship of our church. Whatever it is that God's dealing with your heart about, obey him this morning. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts today. I'm asking, Lord, that your perfect will would be done in each heart and life. No one would resist you today, but God, you would strengthen the faith of all of us who need to have faith in God. Oh, Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you and know that you can do the impossible. We love you. Have your way in our invitation this morning, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob will sing the invitation song. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him now this morning. Will you please? Oh, soul, you. are That's you right. weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there. Over us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace his word shall not fail you he promised believe him and all will be well then go to a world that is dying his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes 
upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Look this way for a minute, would you? You know what you need when you're leaving for the mission field in nine days? Faith in God. That's what you need. We've got some Moreland children here today. Brother Ron's preaching over in Newark this morning. You know what you need when you're planning your survey trip? You just got tickets in yesterday for July. Parrix will be going over to Siberia, Russia, for a survey trip. Faith in God faith in God. Job 42, verse 2. Job, well, verse 1 says, Job answered the Lord. And he said this. Are you ready? Job said, I know that thou canst do everything. I know that thou canst do everything. Isn't that a great statement? Would you sometimes when you when you get down to pray, you just ought to remind now you're not reminding God, but you're reminding yourself. It you know, Job wasn't telling God something God didn't know. But he sure was reminding himself that God can do everything. And God can do anything. Amen. Amen. All right. We have the, uh, don't forget, the invitations for the Easter services are down on the table. Uh, grab a handful of those and pass them out. I apologize for the paper. It's a little thin, and so they curl up some. But if you'll kind of, if you would roll it opposite of the way it's curling, you find out that it, it straightens out pretty nice. Okay? So uh, work with it a little bit, and I think it'll be good. And then uh, the bags of hope are there. Brother Danny's back there ready to pass them out to you. And then the signs are, I think, back there somewhere. And uh, just lay those there. And if you want to pick one of those up to go in your yard, if you know somebody could use one, uh, let's, uh, let's pass them out. They won't do any good sitting inside the church. Amen. And uh, remember, put them blank out and then turn them around Easter Sunday morning and announce that he is risen. Okay? All right, let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. And thank you, God, that you're worthy and that you actually, Lord, we give you faith, but you give us the faith to put in you. It's a gift of God. And, Lord, we're, we're thankful that our faith can be in God. I'm so glad that we can cast all our care upon you because you care for us. Thank you, Lord, for all the promises of the book. And I pray, Lord, that what we heard today would be heard mixed with faith so it would profit and help us and that we'd live the Bible we've learned today. Give us a good Sunday afternoon. Prepare our hearts, what you have for us this evening in the evening service, and bring us back at that time. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm, a, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Let's sing that together. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join hands with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.